All right, let's uh, have prayer together. God in heaven, please uh, be with us now as we open scripture. We just ask that you'll please be with us. May we have a better understanding of this passage, Acts chapter 9. It's my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see if this is going to work for us here. All right, I do have one more quick announcement. Um, several years, a number of years ago, uh, there was a guy that was going to church here. He's also a former Arise student. His name is Eric Johnson. Does that name mean anything to you out there? Okay, great. So anyway, I don't know if you knew this or not, but I thought I would do my part here. Uh, Eric and Monique Johnson are doing what's called a Kickstarter campaign for their new studio album. And uh, basically, they're trying to raise money. They have 26 days to raise their allotted goal, which is $15,000. They're already doing quite well. And uh, if you want to help them, uh, my wife and I are going to help. If you'd like to help them long term, well, I don't know how long they were members here, but they were members here for a little bit. Eric was. You just go to helpericandmonique.com. Helpericandmonique.com. And that'll take you right to their Kickstarter campaign. And you can uh, pledge some money to help them get their new studio album up and running. You don't, it doesn't have to be a huge pledge. It can be just 10, 15 bucks. Uh, they'd be really thrilled. And if you go, I think, above like $20 or something, you get various gifts and prizes. So anyway, I'm a big believer. I love, by the way, the music that our song services do here. But I just want to say a word about that. Like 90% of the songs that we sing were not written by members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know that. And so any opportunity that I get to support young, creative, Seventh-day Adventist songwriters, I do it. Because I, 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 I love singing the songs that Hillsong and others put out. Hey, great, don't mind that one bit. But I would love to be able to sing more songs with the unique Seventh-day Adventist message that God has committed to us. And uh, I want to challenge some of my own uh, church members here. God bless you. Uh, several, several of you in this congregation have musical talent. I want to challenge you to write some of those songs that are uniquely Adventist in their perspective. And so anyway, go support these guys and uh, great what they're doing. I love their music and looking forward to their new album. All right, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Let's go there together. Acts chapter 9, the last time we were together in our devoted series, Jared, Pastor Jared, took us through a fantastic sermon on Acts 8. Really well done, well communicated, and prior to that, we had a great sermon on Acts 7 from Pastor Daniel. So we're in Acts chapter 9, and uh, let's just kind of get our bearings here a little bit. In many ways, the first, uh, this would be sort of an overly simplistic view of the topography of Acts, but it'll help somewhat, I think. In many ways, the first third of the book of Acts is largely focused and orbiting around Peter. Uh, the scholars would say the first third is Peterine, right? Having to do with or relating largely to the experience, the adventures, the sermons of Peter. The last two thirds of the book of Acts are largely Pauline, right? And we go with Paul on his various missionary journeys throughout Asia Minor and ultimately ending in Rome. And so you can sort of think in that very simple way about the book of Acts. The first third evol evol sort of revolves around Peter. The last two thirds revolve largely around the experience of Paul. Well, here in Acts chapter 9, we are in one of those pivotal chapters where we'll be transitioning toward largely the ministry of Paul. In fact, we'll just have two more brief chapters, Acts 10 and 11, that deal with Peter. And then from there on out, it's largely Paul right to the end of the book. Now, here in Acts chapter 9, we're introduced to the conversion of the man that we know as the Apostle Paul, who formerly was known as Saul of Tarsus. Now, as I read through uh, Acts chapter 9, in fact, only about the first 31 verses deal with Paul. The last few verses deal with the uh, two experiences with Peter, a man named uh, um, Aeneas is healed, and then a woman by the name of Dorcas is resurrected. We'll spend no time particularly on those today. We're going to spend all of our time on the conversion of Paul, uh, Saul into Paul. Uh, but we're going to look at this in a way, uh, when I first sat down and started going through the sermon, I had three points. But one of those points is so singularly important, so significant, that I decided to drop the other two points, important though they were, so that there would be just a single idea, a single portrait, a single picture to remember. And I want to use a little bit of homiletical embellishment here. If 
you as an individual, you as a follower of Jesus, you as a member of the Kingscliff Church and of the Worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church, for those of you that are, could understand and adopt this one single idea and principle that we're going to look at today. It could literally be revolutionary for the rest of your experience. Furthermore, let me embellish still a little bit beyond that. The idea that I'm going to share with you today will probably be new for at least, I would guess, half of you and maybe as many as 70, 75 or 80 percent of you. I'm going to talk to you today about seeing what God sees and what faith is, biblically speaking. Many of us, if I handed out a piece of paper and I said, okay, write down what faith is, we would have probably a lot of different definitions, maybe as many different definitions as there are people in this room. But what I want to show you in the context of the story of Acts chapter 9, what faith is, biblically speaking. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to go right to Acts chapter 9, we're going to start reading in verse 1, and we're going to walk through this presentation, this sermon that has one single point. Okay, so let's read the story, the story that many of us think we know really well, probably some of us do. Let's start in verse 1, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. It says, then Saul, what's his name, everyone? Saul, then Saul, and I like Luke's language here, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. I like that. It's picturesque, right? It's, it's, there's, a, there's a certain ethos there. There's a certain anger there. He's breathing threats and murder against the church, and he goes to the high priest, and he has a request, verse 2. He asks for letters from the high priest to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now you'll notice there in verse 2 that those that uh, Paul wants to bind, that he wants to put into prison, breathing his murderous threats against them, are called the way. What are they called, everyone? The way. The reason they're called the way at this point is that they are largely, almost entirely Jewish. Right? Well, how do you distinguish between a Jew that does believe that Jesus was the Messiah and a Jew who doesn't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah? They didn't yet call them Christians. They don't actually come to be called Christians until later when a Gentile congregation is planted in Antioch. We'll get to that in Acts chapter 11. But at this point, they were simply called the way. This was a group of Jews who came to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was, in fact, the promised Messiah. And so Paul, breathing out murderous threats with his desire to put people in prison who hadn't followed Jewish orthodoxy, goes to the high priest in Damascus and says, or goes to the high priest and says, hey, look, I'm going to travel to Damascus, and on that road, if I find any of these troublemakers, any of these contrarians who are of the, the way, that thinking, that school of thought, that that man that we crucified several years ago, that guy... That, that he is the Messiah, I want to stick him in jail where they belong. Verse 3. As he journeyed on this errand, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round him from heaven. Verse 4. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, what are the next two words? What are they? Saul, Saul. Now, there are three other instances in the New Testament where Luke records Jesus as saying someone's name twice. Does anyone know one of them? Does anybody, I, I, I thought you guys would get them all, to be honest. Jared, do you remember one? Where Jesus says the name twice. Good guess. Oh, wow. All right, I see we have a lot of work to do. Jesus, in Luke chapter 10, when he was sitting in the house of Mary and Martha, and Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and uh, she protests and says, say to, say to my sister Martha, she needs to get up and help me. Why doesn't she help? Jesus says, or Martha says this to Mary, Jesus says, what does he say? Martha, Martha. Right? Martha, Martha. In another instance, in, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus is just there on Mount Olivet, and he's overlooking Jerusalem, and what does he say there? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you together. And in another place, in Luke chapter 22, when, when Peter has just assured Jesus that even if everyone were to deny him, he would be faithful to the end, what does Jesus say? Simon, Simon. Now, this is a very important point. Luke records these three instances, and in each instance, Martha, Martha, 
O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Simon, Simon, and here Saul, Saul. Listen very carefully. In each instance where Jesus employs this, this double name, David, David, in each instance, the person is undergoing a major misunderstanding of what could and should be happening. When Jesus says, Martha, Martha, he's rebuking her because Mary, in fact, had chosen the better path. When Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says, you were supposed to be the one that received the Messiah, that anointed the Messiah, that celebrated the Messiah, but in fact, you historically have killed the prophets and those that were sent to you. When Jesus says, Simon, Simon, oh, Simon, are you kidding? Do you really think that you will be faithful, that all will deny, that all will rebel, that all will go against me, and you will be Simon, Simon? Whenever there's a major misunderstanding about what is taking place at the present moment, it's as if Jesus gets the attention by saying it not just once, but twice. I don't know how it was in your household, but in my household, when my mother would say, David Charles, that communicated something, right? Instantly, it was, if it was David Charles, get down here, right? It was, I was in trouble. And when Jesus says, Saul, Saul, Luke is communicating something. There is a major misunderstanding, just as with Martha, Martha, just as with Simon, Simon, just as with Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Saul, Saul, what in the world are you doing? Now, that's my own translation. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, there is probably no easily apprehendable context for us as Seventh-day Adventists to appreciate just how significant this this interaction with Jesus of Nazareth is going to be for Saul. I mean, it would be, maybe some kind of analogy could be attached to this. If I was traveling, I've used this analogy before, if I was traveling somewhere to preach an evangelistic meeting, and, and let's say that a, a bright light shone around, David Asherick, the Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, and, and I was blinded and I couldn't see, and there was just this, this clearly supernatural experience, and, and I hear a voice that says, David, David, why are you persecuting me? Now watch what happens. Saul says, who are you? Who, who is that? I, I can't see. You. What is that voice? Who, who are you and how do you know my name and what do you mean I'm persecuting you? Back to the analogy of David, David, why are you persecuting me? Imagine if I were to hear, I am the Pope. God's voice and vicar on earth. Please stop saying all those mean things about me. Would that be a reorientation of my theological picture, yes or no? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're the who? I'm the Pope. Ego te absolvo. Right? That would be literally turning David Asherick, the Seventh-day Adventist evangelist's world, totally and completely upside down. Because everything I was just sure was A is now B, and everything I thought was B is now A. Saul is just sure that he's doing the right thing. He is just sure that he's on God's errands. He is just sure that Jesus of Nazareth was a counterfeit and a fake, that all of these people that are associated with the way are troublemakers and miscreant Jews that need to be placed in a prison. And so when he asks the question in terror and in blindness, who are you? Notice the very first thing that it said, I am who? I'm Jesus. And this would have been no less radical, no less tectonic, no less, you know, upside down turning of the world than it would be if the Pope were to say to me, I'm the Pope. Stop preaching those sermons about Revelation 13. What? <laughs> huh? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And then he gives an insight here into the fact that he even knows his circumstance. He knows his inner battles, his inner tortured conscience. He had been there, as Jared brought to our attention in Acts chapter 8, when Stephen was stoned, it says that they laid the coats at, at the feet of Saul. He was there. His, his conscience has been tortured. He's wrestled day and night, wondering, how does this man die with such poise, with such calmness, with, su with such dignity? And so when he hears those words, I know it's hard for you to kick against the goads. You're kicking against the pricks. I know your heart. Look at verse 6. So he trembling and astonished. That is an understatement if there ever was one. First of all, he's trembling. Why, Why does somebody tremble? In what context or situation does somebody tremble? He's what? He's afraid. He's frightened. He's terrified. And he's astonished. He cannot 
believe that the very one that he had been seeking to persecute, the very church, the very way that he had been seeking to bring under control and under punishment from the religious leaders, he cannot believe that this is the one. Lord, he says, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He's blind. Temporarily here, his sight is taken from him, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus and he was there. Now look at this. This just gives you a little window Luke is often the master of understatement, things that are huge, things that are significant. He often just says in very simple, very plain language, it says, he was three days without sight and he neither ate nor drank. Now, when was the last time that you went three days without eating? That's not easy to do, but it's possible, right? You can fast for three days. It's one thing to not eat for three days, and it's an entirely different animal to not what? Drink for three days. He is in deep I mean, just imagine now what's going on in his mind. His not eating and his not drinking could very easily be an attempt at preliminarily or experimentally with suicide. I mean, you think about what he's experiencing right now. He was just sure that he was on the right path. He was a young, promising, upwardly mobile upstart. I mean, this guy, the chief priest believe in, believes in him. The others believe in him. He's studied under Gamaliel. This guy is an up-and-coming Pharisee of the Pharisees. And on the road to Damascus, he just had his entire world turned upside down. And he comes to the epiphany, to the realization that the very... The very ones and the very person that he had been seeking to, to diminish the influence and to persecute is actually the true Messiah. In a state of what could probably only be described as abject depression. I mean, think of the soul wrestling that he would have been going through. And now, not only that, he has to think back on the experience of Stephen where he acquiesced, where he was complicit to the death of somebody who he now knows to have been in the right. I was reading this morning from the book Acts of the Apostles and came across this simple paragraph. Stricken with blindness, helpless, tortured by remorse. Let those three words sink in there. Tortured, not physical torture, not external torture, not waterboarding, no. Tortured not from the outside, not from the external, but from the inside. Tortured by remorse. Now look at this. Knowing not what further judgment might be in store for him. He sought out the home of the disciple Judas, where in solitude he had ample opportunity for reflection and prayer. I love that sentence there, not knowing what further judgment might await him. You can just imagine with the picture of God that Saul had up to this point, how is God going to react? How is God going to treat somebody like this? Somebody who was complicit in the death of a man who was clearly filled with the Spirit, clearly gifted with intelligence and reasoning, a man named Stephen. His conscience is tortured. And all he can think is, I'm going to get it. In the same way, but to a much greater degree, the way that you might used to feel when your parents would send you to your room when you were in real, you'd, you'd done something you shouldn't have done. Go to your room, and when I'm ready, I'll come and, and you just sit in your room pining and wondering and thinking, oh, what's going to happen? And you know that if Scripture says, if Luke goes to the point, he doesn't have to record this detail. Why does he record this detail to say he didn't eat and he didn't drink? He wants you to know that he was in great sorrow. He was, he was literally rethinking all of his past, all of his understanding. The stoning of Stephen and everything would have come before him in cinematic vision, and he suddenly realizes that he's on the wrong side of history. Now, here's a remarkable thing, verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple. Now, this is kind of cool, because Luke here is writing in what you might call cinematic fashion. This is almost like a script, Right? If you were going to make a movie, this would be the, the, where the scene cuts. So scene one opens with Saul requesting you know, the letters to put these people in prison. Scene one, and he gets the permission. Scene two cuts, new camera angle. He's on his way to Damascus. Bright light shines around him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and he is led away. That's how scene two would have ended if you were making this as a movie. He's led away into some place there, the house of Judas in Damascus. Scene three opens. Saul's not even in the picture. 
New guy, new situation. This fellow's name is Ananias. He's the second Ananias that we've encountered. The first Ananias in Acts chapter 5 was a bit of a, a knucklehead. This Ananias is the opposite. He's a goer. And look at what happens. Verse 10. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord appeared in a vision and, and said, Ananias. Now, by the way, not Ananias, Ananias. Just Ananias. Here I am, Lord. Not who are you, Lord. By the way, Luke is intentional here. Saul, who is clearly misunderstanding the nature of the situation. Saul, who was persecuting. It's Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting? Who are you? As contrasted with Ananias. Here I am, Lord. He knew who was speaking. By the way, if your Bible is like my Bible and the words of Jesus are in red... You'll notice that the Lord that's being spoken of here is not some generic reference to God. This is Jesus. This is the resurrected Jesus, the crucified, resurrected, living and interceding Jesus. Ananias, here I am, Lord. Now watch this. So the Lord said to him, arise. Be a great name for a school, don't you think? Arise. By the way, Arise America started last week. 30 students. I'll be traveling there in a couple weeks for 10 days for the first of my two teaching practicums there. Absolutely awesome. The 13th class at Arise. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get back there and teach. Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called, drum roll, ask for somebody when you get there, Ananias. You know Judas. You know the one that lives over there, 1408 Straight Street. Oh yeah, been there many times. Had potluck. His wife makes great rice and beans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go there and ask for Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Now, now this is good news. But it's very difficult to believe good news. And so Ananias puts up a little bit of a protest. He's going to educate God. God, I'm not sure you know who we're talking about here. Okay, just want to be sure you know. Verse 13, he said, Lord, just heads up on this. I have heard from many about this dude, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And even here we've heard, we've got word on the street. Somebody sent me an email that said, this guy's got authority from the chief priest to bind everyone who calls on your name. I don't want to spend the rest of my days in prison, so I'm not really keen to go to Judas's house and look for Saul of Tarsus. Now here's the one point. I told you there was one point in the sermon, and here's the point. This story, in many ways, is about blindness, and this story in many ways is about seeing, but it's not about the blindness and the seeing that you might think. God is going to share something here with Ananias that is huge, and this is what he's going to share with him. He is going to share with Ananias his vision for Saul of Tarsus' life. You see, God sees something that Ananias doesn't see. And God sees something, and this is where it gets really awesome, that even Saul himself doesn't see. God sees something, and right here he's going to communicate to Ananias what he sees. Verse 15, absolutely mind-blowing, total turn and twist of plot. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Remember, this is Jesus. He is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name, the name of Jesus, before Gentiles, before kings, before the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17, these are two of the most beautiful words in all of Holy Scripture. Ananias went his way, no doubt still with fear, no doubt still with trembling, but Ananias believes God's vision. Ananias believes what, everyone? God's vision. Look at this. Watch this. Ananias went his way. He entered into the house and laying his hands on him. He didn't speak it from across the corner. That communicates closeness. It communicates intimacy. Touch is one of the, 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 the love languages. And when you put your hand on someone, it can communicate someone. It can communicate something negative if you lay your hand on them forcefully or restrictively. Or it can communicate something assuring, something kind, something friendly. And he puts his hand on him. Look at this. And what are the first two words? Now flash back to the scene. Flash back to the scene, tortured by remorse, not eating, not drinking, anticipating further judgment yet to come. 
And in that state of prayerful, reflective, and terrified solitude, the first two words that come to his ears, here they are, the first two words that come to his ears, Brother Saul. What would those words have sounded like falling on those terrified, pensive, waiting for judgment ears? Brothers, how would he have said it? Brother Saul? With kindness, with compassion, with tenderness, and here, listen to this, listen to this. With belief. With belief. With belief that what he's saying will actually occur, that it will become the reality. Here, Ananias is speaking faith into Saul's life. I want to say that again. Here, Ananias is speaking faith into Saul's life. And let me take it a step further. He is speaking faith into Saul's life that Saul himself doesn't even have yet about his own life. Ananias sees something in Saul that Saul doesn't even yet see it himself. Well, how does Ananias see what Saul himself can't see about his own life? Because God said to him, I got big plans for this guy. He's going to bear my name before Gentiles. He's going to bear my name before kings. This guy is going to do great things for me. He's going to suffer many things. He has no idea what's in store for him, but Ananias, I've given you just a glimpse. And Ananias, in the strength and in the confidence, with a little bit of fear and trepidation, no doubt, he goes to Saul, puts his hand on him, and with friendliness, with compassion, with kindness, and with belief and faith, he speaks God's will into Saul's life. Brother Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a token, as a token that what Ananias was saying was true, immediately, verse 18, immediately, not in a moment, not, not an hour, not the next day, not through some natural remedy. No, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. Luke wants you to know that. It was immediately, it was at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now, again here, Luke, a, a master of understatement. There is so much going on here. This, this little passage of Scripture is so pregnant with, with meaning and significance. I mean, what happened there? When his eyes suddenly open, I can only imagine there must have been weeping, but not weeping the fear of judgment or torture or, or forthcoming punishment. No, he's weeping tears of joy. He can't believe the very Jesus that he had persecuted, the very Jesus whose, whose beloved Stephen he had stoned, and God knows how many others he placed in prison or murdered. He himself calls himself a murderer later. That that Jesus would not respond in kind, but that that Jesus would respond with kindness, with compassion, and with a calling on his life, immediately, tsh, his eyes open, tsh, and immediately the guy is baptized. Verse 19, so when he had received food, well, you would too, he began to regain his strength. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. I want you to keep your finger right here in Acts chapter 9. We've got through the main part of the story. I want you to go with me to a passage of Scripture that you've probably read Many of you, a hundred or a thousand times before, but I want you to read it with new eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now you tell me, Bible students, those of you that are turning there, if you were going to summarize 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what do we call that? We call that the what? We call that the love chapter, right? And many of us know parts of that love chapter. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm just a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I'm a noisemaker. But what I want you to see here is amazing. Paul says that love is many things and love does many things and love doesn't do many things. But I want to show you something here. Very interesting. In Luke chapter, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7 that you might have skipped over. I know I skipped over it. I skipped over it a hundred times. And I'm guessing that many of you have skipped over it before. It's in verse 7. Love bears all things. And look at that next phrase. Love believes all things Love hopes all things. Love believes and love hopes. I want you to say that with me. Love believes and love hopes. What does that mean, love believes all things? Well, we've already discussed in this, uh, it, over the uh, course of this series and the last series at length that God is love. 
Can you say amen to that, saints? He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if love sees all things and believes all things and hopes all things, and God is love, that must mean that God believes, that God hopes. Listen, you ready for this? That God has faith. What? I thought I was the one that had faith. Indeed. Indeed, and no one would deny that, least of all me. But is there a sense in which God is hoping, in which God is believing, and which, in which God has faith? The answer is yes. Look at your screen here. I want to take you on a little journey, a journey that could change the scope and the trajectory of the rest of your religious life. God sees not only what is, he sees what will be, but he also sees what what? What does that say there? God sees what could be. God sees possibilities, not just realities. He not only sees what is, he sees what could be. And what I want to do here is share with you, very interesting, two statements from one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a woman by the name of Ellen White. She wrote extensively on many subjects, but two of the subjects that were nearest and dearest to her heart were education and the medical work. Education and the medical work. And she was absolutely innovative in many of the ways that she saw education as holistic and the medical work and healing as holistic. Absolutely ahead of her time. No question about that. Don't have time to get into it here. But in this particular one, I want you to see she is writing... And this one, she's writing to doctors in our medical work. And, and Seventh-day Adventists, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist here today, this will not be news to you. But if you're not, uh, Seventh-day Adventists are very um, involved in, very actively involved in the medical work, whether it's doctors or nurses, various medical professionals, operating a number of uh, hospitals, you know, dozens of hospitals, and even a, a medical school in the United States, a world-renowned medical school at Loma Linda. Ellen White saw a lot of this. She saw that this could have happened if they would take seriously the healing ministry of Jesus. And here she's going to write two paragraphs to medical missionaries, nurses, doctors, and others who work in the medical field, and she has some advice for them. I want you to notice her advice. Very interesting. She says, I have been instructed that in the medical missionary work, we will discover in the very depths of degradation men who, though they have given themselves up to intemperate, dissolute habits, will respond to the right kind of labor, but they need to be recognized and encouraged. Here's what she's saying. I have been shown that as we go out as doctors, as nurses, as massage therapists, as all of those things, we will meet people who have ruined their lives absolutely ruin their lives. They've ruined their lives through habits, through addictions, through poor choices. She says, when we meet these people, they will respond, but to the right kind of labor. Well, what kind of labor is that? Next paragraph, she continues. Firm, patient, earnest effort will be required in order to what? What do we have to do to people who have ruined their lives through decades of poor decision making? We have to, what do we have to do? <laughs> Lift them up. They cannot restore themselves. By the way, that is not just true about those that are in the deepest pits of degradation. It's true of every single person in this room. They cannot restore themselves. They cannot restore themselves. They may hear Christ's call, but their ears are too dull to take in its meaning. Their eyes are too blind to see anything good in store for themselves. They are dead in trespasses and sins. There are those of us in this room who not only know people like this, there are those of us in this room who have been this person. Years of bad decisions, years of poor choices, years of going down the wrong path, and we can't even see any hope for ourselves. But you know what she's saying here? She's saying in the medical missionary work, our doctors, our nurses, and our church members, we will encounter people like this. And she's saying when they can't see anything good for themselves, you see it for them. You see for them and in them a future that they can't even imagine for themselves. And by the way, this is not just the drug addict. This is not just the person hard out. This is not just the person who's made series of poor financial decisions. These are your own children. We need to see in our children when they've made that bad choice, when they've done that thing we thought our children would never do, we need to see in them a future that they might not even be able to see for themselves. Look at that. She concludes that paragraph there. Yet even these, those that have ruined their lives through decades of poor decisions, yet even these are not to be excluded from the gospel feast. They are to receive the invitation, come, though they may feel. How do people like that feel? They feel 
unworthy. What does the Lord say? The Lord says, compel them to come in. And I love this sentence. Listen to no excuse. And I like this. By love and kindness, lay a hold of them in the very same way that Ananias laid hold of Saul and said, Brother Saul, I see what you can't see. God has given me a vision for your life. Lay hold on them. Listen to no excuse and speak the faith of God into their lives. That's medical missionary work. How about this one? We have the privilege at the Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church to run a school called Tweed, to help run a school called Tweed Valley, Tweed Valley Adventist College. And I am absolutely thrilled with that school. Just had a meeting this week over there with Paul and his team, uh, Blair and uh, uh, Marty, sitting down talking about how we can more fully integrate the, the schools with the various churches in the area. Thrilled to have a school like that. But I'll tell you, anybody who is a teacher or who operates in school administration will, will know that running a school is a very difficult task. Am I wrong or am I right? Because not every kid is a great kid. Not every kid does, makes all the right decisions. Some kids make really bad, difficult, frustrating, annoying, unbelievable decisions. And when those kids make those bad decisions, how do you relate? As an administrator, do we expel? Do we suspend? Do we punish? Do we give mercy? And here is a very interesting chapter she wrote in a book called Fundamentals of Christian Education. And she's writing in a chapter titled On the Suspension of Students. Now, what she says here could literally change the course of your life and the course of your children's life. Okay, you listen to what she says, because the principle is applicable to far more than just the suspension of students from a school. We live in a hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. If you believe that, say amen. That is the world we live in. We live in a world where people hold other people in front of video cameras and say, if you don't do X, Y, Z, Mr. Obama, we're going to chop this guy's head off, and they do it. That's the world you live in. That's a crazy world. I just read one of the most disturbing things I've read in the last couple of years. If you are interested, you can send me an email, davidastrick at mac.com. I'll give you a link. It's an article on the state of what's called extreme pornography. I'll tell you right now, if the Lord Jesus doesn't return, it will be a miracle if we can protect the next generation from a total and complete irredeemable perversion of what sexual love is. That's the world we live in. It's crazy. It's wild. Okay, that's the world we live in. A hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. Satan and his confederacy are plying every art. We talked about this with our young people in Sabbath school. Kids, I hope you're paying attention. This is what I was talking about. Satan and his confederacy are plying every art to seduce the souls for whom Christ has given his precious life. Everyone who loves God in sincerity and truth will love the souls for whom Christ has died. If we wish to do good to souls, now you watch this, this is a game changer right here. This is a paradigm shifting moment for many of you. If we wish to do good with souls, our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief in our belief in and appreciation of them. Let me say that again. Our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief in our belief in them. Continuing, respect, respect, respect shown to the struggling human soul is the sure means through Christ Jesus of the restoration of the self-respect the man has lost. When the man or the woman or the child or the student has lost their own self-respect, how do we relate? We respect them. We can project a better future into their lives, into the lives of our children, into the lives of those who are struggling, into the lives of those who have ruined their lives through bad decisions. We can have faith for them when they cannot have faith for themselves. We can see a future that they can't see for themselves. Ananias put his hand on Saul's shoulder and he said, Brother Saul, God showed me something. He showed me what your life is going to be. You're going to take his name before Gentiles. You're going to take his name before kings. You think that this is suffering. This is the beginning. But you won't be suffering in persecuting. You will be suffering in being persecuted. Ananias just speaks a whole new world, a whole new reality into Saul's life. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He is acting like Jesus. And by the way, you go read the Gospels with this in mind, you'll see it all over the place. You'll see it all over the place. Jesus speaking faith into the lives of people who had no faith. I'll give you a great one. This is a classic. 
John chapter 8, and there are well-meaning Christians who use this text in all the wrong ways, but I'm going to tell you how to use it in the right way right now. John chapter 8, a woman has been caught in adultery, and she's been thrown at the feet of Jesus, and the guys are just about ready to stone her, and of course the whole thing was a setup, but Jesus arrives, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, and a marvelous thing happens, they go out one by one until finally Jesus is left alone with, left alone with the girl, and most translations say, does, any, does no one condemn you? And she says, no man, Lord? Like with a period, a declarative. No man, Lord. No, 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 no. It's an interrogative. She's saying, no man, Lord? Because she can tell. She could hear by the pitter patter of footsteps. There's only one person left in the room. The only one who stuck around is the one who could have legitimately cast the stone. So she's not saying, no man, Lord. No man condemns me. She's saying, no man. And then Jesus speaks faith into her life. He says, I see for you what you can't even see for yourself. Go and sin no more. She couldn't have imagined a life different than her life. She couldn't have imagined not doing what she's been doing her whole life up to that point. But Jesus sees for her what she can't see for herself. And he speaks belief. He speaks faith into her life. Our success with these people will be in proportion to their belief and our belief in them. We believe in people. Look at this, last, last sentence here from this paragraph. Our advancing ideas of what they may become is a help that we ourselves cannot fully appreciate. We cannot overestimate the power of believing in someone else. You're going to be better off. Your life is better than that. Your life is going to be bigger and broader. There's going to be horizons. There's going to be vistas. There's going to be victories. I can see it. When they can't see it for themselves, our success will be in their belief and our belief in them. Didn't I already tell you that love believes all things? So you've read that a hundred times. I read that a hundred times, didn't know what I was saying. Every one of us in this room knows the power of words like these. Every one of us in this room, whether you're a 50-year-old cynic teetering on the borders of Adventism or Christianity, or you're a 13-year-old boy sitting there who thinks that your dad is the greatest thing in the world. Every one of us in this room knows the power of words like these. Words like, I know you can do it. I believe in you. You're the right person for this job. You've got this. I know you'll give your best. You see what's happening? When we speak words like this, and every one of us in this room knows if you take a certain person in your life who's, who's had a big influence, maybe it was a mentor, maybe it was a father, maybe it was a mother, maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a, a person that you've looked up to, if that person speaks faith into your life, speaks belief into your life, speaks confidence into your life, you feel like you can do anything. This is the formula for every sports movie that's ever been made. Right, every sports movie ends to some degree with the coach speaking to the team and injecting his faith, his belief, right? Whether it's Hoosiers or remember the Titans or Friday Night Lights or, or the, you know, the Cinderella Man. It's always the coach speaking faith into the life of the person. And, and, and the, the, you know, the symphony score is doing its thing and there's a sense building because they say, you believe in me? You believe it? If you believe in me, then I'm going to believe in myself. And I want to tell you something here today. God believes in you. God believes in you. Man, Jesus could have stuck it to Saul. He could have stuck a sword right in him. Could have stuck a spear right in him. Could have just blinked him out of existence. But what does he do? He says, go spend some time in your room, Saul. Go think for three days. No food, no water, no vision. Just go think about your life. And in that time, that foreboding in anticipation of judgment and rebuke and punishment, doosh, that hand of compassion and kindness and faith is laid on his shoulder. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus that appeared to you appeared to me, and he's got plans for your life. The scales fall from his eyes. Immediately he was baptized. Wouldn't you be? immediately you'd be baptized, I tell you. But even here, we have to be careful how we speak faith into somebody's life. We have to be careful that when we speak faith into somebody's life, we're not putting an artificial cap on what God could do. God is bigger than even our own dreams and our own conceptions. We need to believe that God can redeem even the lowest and the most far gone of persons. It reminds me of a cute little story that my son was telling me one time where a dad, it's a, it's a cute story, but, but it, will, it will illustrate the point. The dad put his arm around young 
Timmy. And he said, Timmy, for you, the sky is the limit. And the caption says, and just like that, Timmy's dreams of becoming an astronaut were forever crushed. <laughs> for you, Timmy, the sky is the limit. You're not going to be an astronaut. No way, not you. We live in a hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. Is that true? But what I want you to see is Jesus could have appeared to Saul himself and said, Brother Saul, but look at what he does. And this is the key. Don't miss this point. He appears to Ananias. And he says, Ananias, my church, go speak. He speaks two things. Go speak community, brother, and faith into the lives of those around you. He could have done it himself. Why did he have Ananias do it? Because humans need community. We need a place to belong. Am I right, Terry? Yes. We need a place to belong. We need somebody to come and knock on our door and come and invite them to a church and say, you belong here. This is your home. Brother Saul, Brother Terry, faith is seeing what God sees and believing what God believes. You know this, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Love creates love, trust creates trust, loyalty creates loyalty, and faith creates faith. When we put our faith in other people, when we believe that God can do something, and by the way, this works for yourself too. You look in the mirror and you think, man, I can believe that God will do great things through others, but I can't believe that God will do great things through me. I'm telling you, you need to stop believing what you see and start believing what God sees. What does God see for your life? What does God see for your son? What does God see for your daughter? What does God see for your neighbor? Right? If love begets love and trust begets trust and loyalty begets loyalty, what begets faith? Faith begets faith. Faith creates faith. My appeal to you is to be an Ananias. Reach out to those around you and speak faith and community into the lives of those in your sphere of influence. Who can you put your hand on and say, Brother Saul? Whose future right now is dark, uncertain, maybe just aimless? It doesn't have to be total debauchery or degradation. It could be an aimless teenager. Who do you need to reach out to and speak faith into their life? Speak the belief of God into their life. And sometimes your own belief will be challenged. Ananias' belief was certainly challenged. He was like, hey, you got the wrong guy. Not only do you got the wrong guy with me, you got the wrong guy with him. But God says, no, 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 you'll see. You'll see. A remarkable thing happens a little bit later in the book of Acts. I'll just show you this real quick. We'll just end on this. Right there, Acts 9, flip back. This is the last point I want to bring out. Back to Acts 9. This is a simple thought, but man, is it powerful. Man, is it powerful. Look at this. Acts chapter 9. And um, verse 27. Oh, we'll pick it up in verse 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Well, you would be too if this guy formally... He's a spy. He's an infiltrator. He's just trying to get into the inner sanctum, and then he's going to betray us all. So they were afraid of him. But watch this. I love this. They were all afraid of him. They did not believe that he was a disciple. Look at the next two words. But Barnabas. That's only the second time we encounter Barnabas in the book of Acts. And the first time he's just in a list. It's just a list of names. And you know what's very interesting? You study your Bible. You study Acts from here on out. And you know what it is? It's Barnabas and Saul. It's Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul went here. Barnabas and Saul did here. Barnabas and Saul went here. You know what Barnabas was? Barnabas was that person when others were afraid, when others couldn't believe, when uh, Barnabas was the person that, that drew near and thought the best, he said, I believe in God's vision for you, Saul. And for the rest of Acts, these two are basically inseparable. Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. God calls you to be an Ananias, and he calls you to be a Barnabas. To reach that hand out and say, Brother Saul. But then he also calls you and other people. Maybe it's that person. I want to speak to the teenagers here especially. That person that nobody talks to. That kid that's on the outs. That person that's not cool. That person who's not as good at whatever. And you come in and you invest faith in them. You invest time in them. You invest. You never know. That person could be the, your best friend for the rest of your life. Barnabas and Saul. The Bible at the end of time says that there will be a group of people that have the faith of Jesus. And most of us have probably misunderstood that and thought it meant the faith in Jesus. That's one thing. 
Ain't no question about that. We'll talk about that, faith in Jesus. But that's not what's spoken of there in Revelation chapter 14. You guys, you can start handing out the cards now. That's not what's spoken about in Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, it's the faith of Jesus. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We have every reason to believe that Jesus will not pass us by. We have every textual, biblical, spiritual reason to believe that we will not be left alone. We will not be left in darkness without food and water. Father, Jesus has come and he has spoken into our lives. He has spoken faith. He's spoken hope. He's spoken belief into our lives. And Father, today, as Ananias's and, and Barnabas's, may we go out to our children, to our spouses, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our brothers and sisters, our brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law, to those around us, to our parents. Teach us, as Ananias of old, how to speak faith and speak belief and speak hope into the lives of those around us. Help us to see what they can't see for themselves. And Father, we say with the man of old, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief. In Jesus' name, let the church of the living God say, Amen. Happy Sabbath, you all.